Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fighting Hunger with Housing, Actions and Updates for Advocates, hosted by the Food Research and Action Center. I'm Steve Hayward, Communications Manager at FRAC. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few brief housekeeping items. We expect this webinar to run about 60 minutes. We are recording the presentation and will send the recording and slides in a follow-up email. Closed captioning is available. To turn captions on, select Show Captions, it's the CC button in the bottom taskbar and choose English as the spoken language. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers. To ask a question, please use the Q&A tab in the bottom taskbar. With that, I'll pass it off to Alex Ashbrook, Director of Root Causes and Specific Populations at FRAC. Take it away, Alex. Thanks so much, Steve. FRAC is delighted to be hosting this webinar, Fighting Hunger with Housing, Actions and Updates for Advocates. As you all likely know, housing instability is a root cause of hunger. And all too often we hear the rent eats first or phrases like heat or eat. With families spending more than half of their incomes on shelter, it's no wonder that tens of millions of households cannot afford to put food on the table. This needs to change. That is why FRAC is on the steering committee of Opportunity Starts at Home You'll be hearing more about how you can join this multi-sector campaign later on. And a key to addressing food insecurity and housing instability, in addition to joining this campaign, is for anti-hunger and housing advocates to join forces and advocate together for policies that are essential to ending hunger and securing affordable housing. And that's why we're here today. On this call, you will learn about the intersection of hunger and housing instability, the connections between evictions and decreases in SNAP participation, and finally, key housing policies that promote equity and opportunities to advocate for these policies. Um, we have an all-star cast of speakers. Um, you'll be hearing from Carl Gershenson, um, who's the project director at Eviction Lab. And um, you all may have read the book Eviction, which uh, Eviction Lab was an outgrowth of this phenomenal book and research. Uh, Carl is the director of the Eviction Lab at Princeton University. He has published on the causes and consequences of housing instability in the United States with a special focus on how evictions lead to further economic and residential insecurity. He received his PhD in sociology from Harvard University, and his current research focuses on the relationship between housing and food insecurity, as well as an investigation into evictions in rural America. Next, you'll be hearing from Chantel Wilkinson, who's the National Campaign Director of the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. She's a housing justice um, advocate bringing multi-sector advocates together to advance federal housing solutions. And when she was in New York, she worked as a budget analyst for the state's legislature and helped um, enact housing, corporation, and transportation policies. Also, while she was in New York, she worked on the Breathing Lights campaign with the Center for Women in Government and Civil Society. That campaign highlighted the problem of dilapidated va vacant housing in the capital region of New York State and spurred collaborations between artists, community organizations, neighborhood ambassadors, project administration, administrators, and government officials. So you can tell Chantel's a real um, expert in bringing people together to address um, important social justice issues. All right, and I apologize, Luis Guardia had a call that he had to get on, um, but he is eager to welcome you and to um, join forces with our um, housing advocates to both address housing and food insecurity. All right, um, next slide, Steve. So a quick word on FRAC, um, AKA the Food Research and Action Center. Um, FRAC, for more than 50 years, has been working to build a nation free from hunger through advocacy, partnerships, and by advancing bold and equitable policy solutions. And a key strategy in our work is to support policies and programs that reduce poverty and other root causes of hunger. Next slide. 
So we know that hunger cannot be solved long-term by simply giving people food. Hunger and poverty are driven by economic and social hardships, including insufficient wages, inadequate health care, and lack of affordable housing. And they're also driven by systemic discrimination, which exasperates the rate of hunger and poverty among communities that have been harmed by systems of oppression. Next slide. Now here's how this webinar fits into Frack's theory of change and likely the theory of change for different anti-hunger stakeholders. In order to achieve uh, our vision of a nation free from hunger, systemic inequities that deepen and exacerbate hunger for Black, Latinx, Native American families, and other marginalized groups must be dismantled to create an equitable society. And if we are able to do this and address the root causes of hunger, we will achieve things like economic growth that results in shared prosperity and jobs with adequate wages, conditions, and, this, and support. We'll achieve quality, affordable, accessible health care to promote physical and mental health. We'll achieve healthy, safe, and thriving communities for all, and systems that create and sustain safe communities that are not reliant on incarceration. And we'll also, I'm not going to go through every single thing we need to create a hunger-free um, nation, but we will also achieve, and this is where our speakers come in, affordable quality, quality and accessible housing. Next slide. So unfortunately, um, lack of affordable housing is a root cause driver of food insecurity. And food insecurity and housing insecurity are both pervasive, harm health, and are highly correlated. So they both result from material hardship. Um, at their core, they're both driven by poverty and both impact tens of millions of people across this country. Both housing and food insecurity disproportionately impact Black, Latinx, and Native American households and other families that have, that have experienced structural racism and other forms of oppression. And they're bi-directional. So depletion of household resources for rent means less money for food. And if you deplete household resources for food, you're gonna have less money for rent. But however, many families will cut their food costs before their housing cost. Um, you know, the rent eats first. If you don't pay the rent, you're gonna likely get evicted, whereas food is a more flexible expense. Um, but it, but cutting your food um, quality and quantity comes with, with health ramifications through these harmful coping behaviors. So we know that there are reams of research on how food insecurity harms health and how housing insecurity and instability harms health. There are a few recent studies, however, that look at households that are experiencing both housing and food insecurity. And these studies really highlight that children in, in these households lag behind their peers in physical development, in educational attainment, and in labor market outcomes. And they also experienced poor uh, physical and mental health. There's also a recent study that shows how housing and food instability together increase the risk of mothers experiencing depression and parental stress, and for adolescents experiencing anxiety and depressive symptoms. And finally, there's a study that found together they increase adults' risk for chronic disease. Next slide. The good news is that there's also research on what we all know intuitively, that addressing hunger will lessen one's housing struggles and supporting affordable housing will help alleviate food insecurity. I just wanted to flag two recent studies. Uh, the King study shows how work to connect families to programs like SNAP and other programs that address food insecurity these, these um, connections to, the, to such um, social safety net programs lessen people's material hardship, they strengthen social networks and, they, and uh, social supports, and they can lower the risk of housing instability. And likewise, 
supporting affordable housing can help alleviate food insecurity. Um, in a recent study, authors found that while the, the U.S. is experiencing a severe housing affordability crisis, resulting in households having to make difficult trade-offs between paying for a place to live and basic, basic health necessities, such as food, but that with rental assistance, these, these um, stressors can be mitigated. And the study showed that um, households who were able to access rental assistance improve their food insecurity, and they also improve their consumption of fruits and vegetables. Um, unfortunately, rental assistance, they're long, long, long wait lists for what rental assistance. So that's that's one action that we can take to really help people um, access affordable housing is help with um, the stock of, of um, affordable rental units. And Chantel will be talking about that later on. So these studies are just some of the reasons that you're probably on this call that anti-hunger stakeholders and also housing advocates need to join forces to support families in accessing both nutrition programs and affordable housing. All right, well, we're gonna turn it over um, now to Carl from the Eviction Lab. And um, Carl's gonna discuss our nation's eviction crisis and how um, that crisis intersects with SNAP. So take it away, Carl. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Alex, and uh, thank you to everyone who is on this webinar. I always love an opportunity to talk about housing uh, with audiences that are not already steeped in um, the housing literature, presumably. And I also love the opportunity to learn from uh, everyone here. I am well aware how much more you all know about um, food insecurity and nutrition research than I do. So I really do look forward to your uh, commentary and feedback. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna to present today on some research that I have been uh, doing in partnership with the United States Census Bureau. Um, the paper is called, Is a Housing Crisis Preventing Families from Receiving Food Assistance? And before I go any further, you know, I, I want to emphasize that uh, all opinions expressed belong to me and definitely not to the United States Census Bureau. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to start by giving some background on the eviction crisis in the United States. Uh, you know, it's helpful to know that one third of all U.S. households rent their homes, but this includes most low-income Americans, especially Black and Hispanic Americans. So even before we talk about differences in uh, filing rates for Black households, Hispanic households, and white households, it's important to realize that around 70% of white households own their home, or that's closer to uh, 40, 45% for Black households, right? So a much larger percentage of Black and Hispanic households are in the rental market. And then on top of that, Black and Hispanic renters have higher risks of eviction than white renters. Uh, you add this all up, and we see about 2.7 million unique renter households receiving an eviction filing each year. Next slide. Uh, as I already hinted at, there are significant racial disparities in eviction rates. And um, this slide is actually a slightly outdated. We just had a new publication that updated these um, statistics. But basically what you're seeing here, uh, that white bar represents the um, share of renter households that belong to each racial group. And then the gray and black bars represent the share of uh, eviction filings that go to each racial group. Um, in this slide, we see 20% of renter households are black, but around one third of evictions go against a black family. Um, in our new study, it turns out that this disparity is even worse. We now estimate that over half of filings in this country go against a Black household, despite uh, Black households making up only around 18 to 20 percent of the renter population. So the, you know, the, the racial disparities in housing insecurity are um, really, really stark. Next slide. The other major risk factor um, besides race and low income, is the presence of children in a household. Children are at the very center of the eviction crisis. And what we're looking at here uh, are, 
we broke down the population into five-year buckets. Um, and on the left of this slide uh, is the eviction filing rate for uh, females in each age bucket. And on the right of each figure is the eviction filing rate for males in each age bucket. But um, what really stands out here is that at the bottom of these uh, age pyramids, we see eviction filing rates of around 10% for ages zero to 18. And those are the highest eviction filing rates. So the point in your life when you are most at risk of an eviction is when you are a child. Um, you see that the filing rates go down a little bit at uh, ages 20 through you know approximately 30. And that is primarily because that's an age when a lot of people with higher incomes are renting before they become homeowners, right? So you have a larger denominator, the eviction filing risk goes down. But then the risk goes right back up, um, 30, 35, 40. And what we think is going on there is, again, a lot of the well-off renters are moving out of the renter population. And who's left uh, are renters, tend to be of low to moderate incomes, um, a lot of whom have children, right? So that little bulge around 30 to 40, uh, those are the parents and guardians of a lot of the people who are being evicted between ages of zero and 18. Um, and I don't have a figure for this in this presentation, but this finding interacts with the finding about the disproportionate eviction risk that black renters face. Uh, so we think that around you know 10% of children in renter households receive an eviction filing each year. That number is about 25% of children in black renter in black renter households receive an eviction filing rate each year. Um, a quarter a quarter of, of children in black renter households receive a filing each year. Um, again, just astronomically high numbers. Uh, next slide. Uh, and just to make this point in a slightly different way, uh, we find that over half of evicted households have children present. So that compares to about 30% of renter households overall have a child present, but over half uh, of uh, evicted households have a child in them. And that holds, uh, whether or not it's just a filing or whether or not you ultimately get that judgment. Uh, if you get the judgment, that's when the courts come and enforce your removal from that housing. Next slide. And why does this all matter, right? Well, aside from an eviction being a traumatic event in its own right, uh, we at Eviction Lab and other housing scholars have linked eviction to a number of deleterious outcomes for a household. And we can definitively say that eviction is not just a consequence of poverty, because of course it is. It is lower income people living in poverty who are at highest risk of eviction. But we also know that eviction causes poverty, it exacerbates poverty, um, and it can drive households that are, you know, uh, maybe treading water, um, achieving what looks like a stable existence, they receive that eviction, and a lot of them end up on a downward trajectory uh, that all too often uh, either ends in moving to a neighborhood with fewer amenities, um, or ultimately into a prolonged experience with homelessness. Um, so, you know, specifically, we have uh, research showing that people who experience evictions are more likely to lose their jobs. Um, again, we can link evictions to prolonged housing instability. Uh, we can uh, link evictions to decrease use of Medicaid. Um, and you know, related to that, we, we just had a paper accepted that shows that eviction is linked to significant increases in mortality. Um, more than doubling mortality risk uh, for for families that uh, have lost their households, uh, yeah, have lost their 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 renter households. So this is an enormous problem, and especially when you then think about the concentration of evictions in particular neighborhoods. Um, so think about a highly segregated, uh, highly segregated black neighborhood in uh, cities like Atlanta, Detroit. Um, the Bronx, where you have eviction filing rates of around 40% in some of these neighborhoods. So, you know, it's it's almost half of those households each year are um, being thrown off of whatever economic path they were on, and they are at risk of entering into one of these spirals. And 
our hope is that the safety net would be there for these families to sort of arrest this descent into more intense poverty or into homelessness. And that's where the inspiration for the study came from, um, because the, you know there's research out there that shows that the SNAP program is in fact one of the most responsive safety net programs in the United States. Um, I think that if you look at use of a safety net program after job loss, uh, I forget the exact statistic, I think like there's a 40% increase in SNAP uptake, with well, the point being that um, SNAP was the program that people who just lost their jobs are most able to access. So, you know, we're, we were hoping um, that after an eviction, uh, SNAP is there to help people. Next slide. Uh, but of course, there are all sorts of reasons to believe that this might not be the case. Uh, and a lot of this is rooted in the literature on administrative burdens. Administrative burdens, they structure inequalities in access to social welfare programs. And we know that these burdens uh, are racially disproportionate despite facial, facially race neutral rules. Um, we know this is a problem in SNAP in particular. Uh, SNAP has a 40% churn rate, which is largely attributable to a, a failure to recertify. Uh, back to the previous slide. Um, and we know that the, the, the churn rate is highest among Black and Hispanic families of children. So you know, here is where we are seeing, again, this extreme overlap in which populations are at risk of food insecurity, which populations are at risk of housing insecurity, and which populations are most affected by administrative burdens. And I think it's also worth pointing out here that a lot of the research you know, that identifies um, negative social or health outcomes associated with housing insecurity, food insecurity is also linked with a lot of these negative health and social outcomes. Uh, so we are seeing um, just a risk factor piled upon risk factor and then negative outcome piled upon negative outcome uh, in an extremely uh, worrying way. Next slide. So this led to our, our research questions, which are, I think, fairly straightforward. What effect do evictions have on receipt of food assistance via SNAP, right? Objectively, we know that need for SNAP is going to be higher after an eviction. Uh, so in a world with a zero administrative burdens, an extremely responsive SNAP program, we are going to see SNAP receipt increase after an eviction. In a world where administrative burdens um, sort of outweigh uh, the uh, increased need, we're going to see uptake of SNAP decrease after that eviction. We're also interested in how race mediates the relationship between evictions and SNAP enrollment. Um, also, because we know how much this need is concentrated in households with children, uh, we are curious how the presence of children mediates this relationship. We have not been able to disclose those results from the uh, secure census environment yet. Um, and we are also curious to what extent specific administrative burdens mediate the relationship between evictions and SNAP enrollment. Next slide. So as a data source, we use the eviction labs um, database of eviction records. We have over 100 million eviction records filed in uh, county courts across the country from 2000 to around 2018. Um, we have been able through a partnership with the census to upload those census records. Uh, they are they are anonymized, linked to internal census identifiers, and they were able to link those eviction records to SNAP program data um, from 2010 to 2016. So we know whether or not a household is enrolled in SNAP. Uh, I believe we can observe that for every month. And we also have information on benefit size that we have not um, been able to work into our analyses yet. We're also able to link, so we're then able to link these eviction records and the SNAP records to decennial census records, um, which allow us to learn about the household composition of these families that received eviction filings. We also know their age, their race, you know, the presence of children, and so forth. And then using something called the resident candidate file, we can figure out, does the renter still live in um, the state where we first observed them? This is important because if you moved out of state, you're going to drop off the SNAP records. So we don't want to treat that as you losing an access to SNAP, right? That is a... Um, that's an administrative artifact. And then we also have access to death records, because again, if you die, you are no longer accessing SNAP records. We don't want to treat that as you losing access to SNAP. That is, in a, in a different way, an administrative artifact. So this allows us to put together a sample of all people who received an eviction filing uh, between 2010 and 2016, 
And then we are able to observe whether or not they're using SNAP in the period before that eviction and in the period after that eviction. Next slide. Um, yeah, so to restate that, our final cohort for analysis is all renters filed against in the study state in 2010, 2016. Uh, I am not allowed to disclose the, the state in which the study occurred. Um, all people who received an eviction filing who neither died nor moved out of state during this period. And this amounts to about a half million renters who were filed against but did not ultimately receive that eviction judgment and over 600,000 renters who are filed against and who did receive a judgment, which again, uh, then makes it legally permissible for the landlord to send a sheriff um, to your, your rental unit uh, to uh, enforce your removal from that unit. Next slide. Our methods are designed to estimate the causal effects of an eviction on SNAP receipt. So, you know, we're going beyond uh, statistical associations. Uh, technically, we're using an event study specification. And we have person fixed effects to account for unobserved differences between people and year fixed effects to account for secular trends in program receipt. Next slide. All right, and here's our findings. Um, so the way to interpret this is on the x-axis, we have years since eviction event. So to the left of that zero is SNAP receipt in the years before an eviction event. And in the to the right of that zero is SNAP receipt in the years after an eviction event. And what we're looking at in the years before an eviction event um, are almost trendless, right? You see that levels of SNAP receipt are pretty stable from five years to about one and a half years before an eviction. Uh, this is exactly what you want to see um, from a methodological perspective, right? These are these are it looks like parallel trends between these two groups. Now you see uh, SNAP receipt begin to increase in the period before an eviction. This makes sense because in that year before an eviction, you are likely beginning to experience some deterioration in your material resources, uh, which might lead you to then go and um, apply for SNAP benefits. So, you know, that's great. We, we see, um, <laughs> it's actually pretty small, I guess, but like an almost one percentage point increase in people using SNAP uh, in that run up to receiving an eviction filing. But of course, what we see after we receive that eviction filing is plummeting of SNAP receipt. Um, so despite the fact that we know objective need is going to be much higher in the years following that eviction event, you see almost a three percentage point drop in that first year. But then SNAP receipt continues to deteriorate across uh, for the next five years for people who received a judgment. Now, people who received a filing, which is generally a less um, a, a less disruptive event than receiving a judgment, you see a smaller drop in the first two years, about a two percentage point drop, and then you see people begin to recover and re-enroll in SNAP. But again, the people got a judgment. By the time the five years are up, they are almost eight, an almost eight percentage point drop in SNAP receipt. Uh, next slide. We broke this down by race to see, again, if, if race mediated these effects, uh, you can see these parallel trends in the period leading up to the eviction. Again, that's what we want to see from, from a methodological perspective. And in the years following an eviction, we actually see a larger decrease in SNAP uptake uh, for white households as compared to black households. Um, this is slightly counterintuitive, um, but the way we tend to think about this is we have so much evidence that... Uh, I mean, basically that the rental market is so steeped in racism that it is easier to be evicted. It's easier for a black household to be evicted than a white household. So on average, a white household that is evicted has less resources than the average black household that is evicted. Another way you can think about this is we can show that black households that earn over $70,000 a year have similar eviction rates to white households that earn under $20,000 a year. Um, so again, White house white households conditional on being evicted are often less resourced than black households conditional on being evicted. Next slide. Um, so yeah, we, we we think that this is a major issue. And of course, housing-oriented policy solutions uh are very important here. Um 
you prevent people from being evicted and uh, they won't lose access to their SNAP, right? So emergency rental assistance, good cause eviction laws, subsidized housing, housing vouchers, legal aid for tenants through things like right to counsel, um, and even really technical policy tweaks like an extended notice period. If you have to notify people that you're going to evict them, uh, say you give them two weeks, that gives them that much more time to get their money together and pay back rent. Um, states that have very small periods tend to have higher filing rates. So there's all sorts of good policy that we can do on the housing side. Next slide. Uh, but of course, what's going on here uh, on the SNAP side? Um, on the one hand, we just think that they're, the administrative burdens are too high, right? How many documents do you need uh, to, to prove your identity, uh, to verify your address? When you are evicted, so many of your documents uh, are either going to get thrown out in the move, they, the, the landlord put them out on the curb, maybe they're in a suitcase that's now in a storage locker, uh, maybe mail is going to your old address, mail that you would use to establish your identity, and also mail that would tell you that it's time to recertify. Uh, Maybe in-person interviews are required for recertification, and now you are living uh, in a different county or far away from where that interview would be. There's all sorts of things that just make it harder to recertify after you've um, experienced an eviction. We've also partnered with a researcher who is now doing interviews um, in the field to find out what's going on here. And uh, a lot of people reported that after an eviction, they were aware that their SNAP benefits were going to expire, but they just decided it wasn't worth it anymore because... Um, uh, because if like if you're living in your car, where are you going to store groceries? Because they're perishable or you don't have that space. If you're living in a homeless shelter, you're not allowed to bring in groceries. Uh, where are you going to prepare them? So what's the point of getting SNAP? Again, a lot of people just knowingly letting their benefits expire because they have deemed that the SNAP program is no longer um, helpful in their, in their circumstances. Um, Another technical thing is a lot of families report being no longer eligible for SNAP after they become homeless because you are allowed to deduct rent and utilities uh, from your income when qualifying, uh, when, when seeing if your income qualifies. So ironically, when you become homeless, you can no longer deduct that rent and now you move ab above the income eligibility threshold. So some real perverse ways that the SNAP program is structured. Um, so we would encourage people to look into all of those things. But also, we think that housing services need to be aware that there's this issue and housing services should really help with benefits uh, re-enrollment. Next slide. Um, yeah, and <laughs> that's it for me. Uh, so you, you can find our data and our research at evictionlab.org. And I, I look forward to all your questions and, and comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carl. And um, just you know, reiterating that stunningly terrible statistic of how a quarter of all Black children renters are getting evict an eviction in a year is just something to really work on changing. Um, I encourage folks to put um, questions in the Q and A um, feature, and we'll. Um, recap questions after we hear from Chantel. And thanks so much, Carl. Lots, lots to think about. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Carl. That was a great presentation. I am happy to share about the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And just before I do, I do want to just bring up the issue, just really bring it to a very high level. We've heard things today, we've heard um, kind of the stats, but I do like to frame it on what exactly we're advocating for, who we're advocating for, why this is the group of renters that we really do target with our advocacy. So we say all the time that our nation is really experiencing um, a housing crisis. It's been experiencing a housing crisis now for decades. And so, what we see is that there, the, the nation has 10.9 million extremely low income renter households with only um, 7.3 million um, affordable units available to those that need it. 
And of that, those units, there's only like 4 million that are really available for those that are extremely low income renters. And so what we see is that there really is a shortage of housing available to those um, that really are at the lowest end of that, that income threshold. We often say that the way that we can say that in like a different way is that there's only 33 affordable and available units for every 100 extremely low income renter household. And we also see that of those that have extremely low income rents, um, we see that 72% are severely cost burdened. So when we say that, we mean that they're spending more than half of their income on their housing. So they have less money to spend for medicine, less money to spend for nutritious foods, less money to put towards childcare. And really there's this um, really pervasive idea of what it might mean for someone who is struggling with um, keeping a, uh, keeping housed. And really we see that as people who are working, we see that there are students, we see that there are people who are older, older adults, uh, we see families. And so really when we're talking about extremely low income renter households, the situation may seem different, but there are a lot of people, extremely low income renters, that are really spending more than half of their income on rent, re really making it a burden for them to really afford anything else. Um, and so another thing that we do at NLIHC is that we, we work on this housing wage. So this housing wage kind of shows how much someone might need, we have an average number, um, to make every hour in order to afford housing. So this year, the housing wage was $24 or nearly $24. And that's three times the amount of the federal minimum wage. So we know that across the nation, there are a lot of wages that aren't up to that standard. And people need a lot in wages in order to get to that modest one bedroom home or two bedroom home. We're seeing that people need to work on average eight six hours a week in order to afford a modest one bedroom rental home to keep people housed. And we know that that's like literally impossible for so many people coupled with so many other responsibilities that people need to, to do as well. We see that this is really not an urban issue. We see people say that often all the time that it's really just in the major big cities, but there are 3000 counties across the nation and, and only 7% of them can a renter at minimum wage afford a modest one bedroom home. And there's no county across the US where a person working, a, a full-time worker working minimum wage can afford a modest two bedroom rental home. And that's regardless of what that area looks like, whether it's suburban, rural, or an urban area, we're seeing that across the nation. And so often we say that um, there needs to be a federal action that happens. And the reason why we say that is because we've seen that the programs have been underfunded for decades. Often we get a bit of pushback around this being a local issue or a state issue, that they're very unique across the nation. And so it really is on our local and state policymakers to address the issue. But what we're having and what we're seeing is that they need large parts of large funds of money to help with the unique situations that they're seeing across the nation. So perhaps you do need more vouchers in a in a in an area or you do need more affordable housing in an area, really those things are correct. But if we don't have the full funding that you can only get from the federal government to back those programs and help out our states, then we're really not working in a collaborative way that gets us to where we need to be in the solutions that we actually want to see. So we really do urge our federal policymakers to do something about housing policy. Um, there's a chart um, that I, I can share later, but it just shows the underfunding of our programs. And we've really been underfunded since like the 80s. Um, and so it's it's really a long, a decade, decades of long of underfunded that we've seen in our programs. And you can imagine that that just compounds over time, the a need and the amount of funding that we need for the, our programs. And it's really important. And so after all those um, stats, let's go to the next slide. I just wanna share where we can find more information about it. Um, I have the two reports right here, the gap, it's like a little blurry, the gap is right here and out of reach, um, but they're pretty on the screen. Um, and so NLIHC, they, uh, we release two reports, annual reports um, every year, out of reach and the gap. And it really goes into the need that we see and the, and the gap and the shortage of affordable and available housing for those with the lowest incomes. Uh, I do want to transition us to a video so we can get the video up. 
Um, and we can like skip that next slide because I can just chat about it. Um, but what we're doing uh, to really address this housing crisis at NLIHC is that we launched a campaign in 2018 called Opportunity Starts at Home. And Opportunity Starts at Home was our way of bringing non-housing um, organizations into housing advocacy. So as I mentioned, we've said that we are in a housing crisis and housers have really understood now for decades that we can't do this work alone. And we were also getting to a point where a lot of our partners, including you all, were understanding that without housing, you can't achieve your own goals and priorities because housing is so central to the things that people need. It's really core. It's one of those table discussions that we don't really bring up to like the national attention, but it's, it's the biggest expense that families have um, and, and individuals. And so with that, um, Opportunity Starts at Home is this idea that we're bringing together this diverse coalition of partners from the food space to the health space to education space, all these sectors coming together in order to advance for um, ad advocate for federal housing policy. Um, I'm going to show a video that really just highlights the work that we've been doing. And then I'm just happy to break down more of the work. So if you can play the video now, it'd be great. The housing affordability crisis in the United States mostly impacts the extremely low income renter. So what we're seeing is that 73% of extremely low income renter households are paying more than half of their income on housing. When housing becomes unaffordable to somebody, really everything else starts to crumble as well. In a country as wealthy as ours, we shouldn't have this conversation where people are forced to choose between health costs or housing or food or education. The Opportunity Starts at Home campaign was started by the National Income Housing Coalition, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and Children's Health Watch. We recognized that despite the very best efforts of our organizations, the housing crisis was worsening for the lowest income people. So we knew we had to do something different. Opportunity Starts at Home is a broad movement. It is a housing campaign, but I think what's unprecedented about it and what's so transformational about it is that it's not led by housing organizations. It's led by organizations that are leading in all these other sectors. They're leaders in those sectors, but they're coming together through the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign to advocate for federal housing policy. These groups recognize that first and foremost, they can't meet their goals, whether it's the child welfare system and keeping families together. Whether it's affordability of health care, poverty related hunger, economic security and stability, civil rights, the impacts of climate change, the ability for children to learn and grow and thrive. They can't achieve those things if families don't have a place to live. Housing sits at the center of families' budgets, and when it is unaffordable, it strains their families' budgets in ways that have long-lasting and harmful impacts. We've seen tremendous success at the federal level. The significant policy wins that we've been able to achieve on a bipartisan basis, I think the Opportunity Starts Home campaign really was a major driving political force behind that success. When all the major interests can come together with one voice and say, this is what you need to do to make that change. That's going to be something that's much easier for them to get on board with. Elected officials really need to see that there's broad support for the change that's envisioned by an initiative like Opportunity Starts at Home. So we think bringing in more collaborators, more participants, and more voices that are elevating it brings attention and brings resources and brings innovation. All those things we need to address affordable housing. Inaction is expensive. So as a country, we pay to allow for homelessness and housing insecurity to persist. If we were to invest instead in making homes affordable for the lowest income people, we would have tremendous benefit to children, families, communities, and to the country. It is critically important that everybody have a safe, stable home. And the beauty of the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign is at its core, it's about bringing everyone together across social service systems to improve access to affordable housing.
Thank you. You can um, bring us back up to the, the to the presentation, and we can start from the steering committee slide. Um, but as you see in the video, there's a coalition that's been built. Since 2018, we built a coalition of over 130 national organizations and nearly 30 state partners that have really come together through the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. We do a number of things. You see our steering committee there. Um, FRAC sits on our steering committee and has since 2018. And so you see that most of the organizations on here are not bread and butter housing organizations. We have the Education uh, Association on there, NAACP. We have the Natural Resources Defense Council on there, and they've been taking some really great strides and even working on housing independently within their organization, you know, with the partnership of Opportunity Starts at Home. We see the National League of Cities on there. We see um, Just Leadership USA that really works with the criminal justice legal system. Uh, we see that uh, we have just all these different groups that are part of our steering committee. There's 19 organizations organizations that are part of the steering committee. And these are groups that are really committed to affordable housing, really, um, really committed to mobilizing their networks around the ask that we have. And so I'll get into that in just a minute, but I do want to share the round table, which is the next slide. Our roundtable is our big table. So for us, it's a broad coalition that we're building, meaning that we want all groups to be involved because we really do believe that housing is important to every single aspect of life. So on our roundtable, we have over 110 organizations that are involved in the roundtable. They participate in the campaign and however they feel is most comfortable for them. Some groups we know are just having these conversations around housing or trying to figure out how to build the capacity around housing advocacy and some groups on here are ready to go and maybe they're just as committed and as mobilized as our steering committee members. So we really do give folks a, a, a space to engage with us in the ways that make the most sense. But really what this big tent shows is just how much other sectors are recognizing as well as us as housers that we do need to collaborate together, that working in these sector silos really hasn't been beneficial for us in a way that really um, shows us where policy can go that addresses the holistic um, matter of a person's situation. Usually when we're hearing people with lived experience speak of housing affordability, you hear health, you hear education, you hear how they're struggling in so many different areas. Um, and so this is our big tent of groups that, that support the campaign in some way. And we have state partners, which is the next slide. State partners, we have nearly 30 state partners. Um, as we get supported, we're able to support more state partners in doing the work. And they're essentially doing the same things that we're doing on the national level. They're building these state level multi-sector coalitions and leveraging those partnerships to advance federal housing policy. So a lot of times folks can also reach out to us to connect with our state partners to also help with that community work, um, really help with um, building that multi-sector voice in the state. And it really makes a difference with policymakers when they're able to see that not only us on the national level are advocating for these policies, but we do have state campaigns that also have a multi-sector focus, and it just makes for a very different and very strong approach to the ways that we have been advancing policy. Now let's go into the policy, which is the next few slides. We have within reach, um, you can find that on the website. Let's move on to the next slide to just speak about what it is that we're, we actually advocate for. And so really we, we speak about it in three buckets of things. We talk about a demand side of the problem where we do need to increase vouchers and make sure that we're bridging the gap between rents and incomes. Um, we often talk about a renter's tax credit in this bucket as well. Um, and there's a bill that we've been um, advocating for since 2019, it was reintroduced this year. In the, it was reintroduced in the Senate and then introduced in the House, both bipartisan. Um, and so that bill would create a hundred and, and that, that not a hundred, whoa, 250,000 vouchers for families with small children. Um, and that will be coupled with mobility counseling so people can have the help that they need to get to the housing in which they choose. Uh, we also talk about increasing the supply of affordable housing. So again, we talked about that unique way that housing shows up at all over the nation. And so for some 
some places, it means that we need to build more affordable housing in inclusive communities, in inclusive communities where people can thrive. And so we talk about the National Housing Trust Fund that is a dedicated funding stream for those at 30% AMI and below, area medium income and below. We also um, speak about maybe tweaking some of the programs that we have existing already too. The National Housing Trust Fund, Fund exists, but we also have other housing programs that exist, but we need them to exist in ways that foster an inclusive community that really foster equity that we don't really see all the time. And we also talk about preserving the units in that bucket as well. So often every single year, we're really fighting back against cuts to the housing program. You saw that we're underfunded and we continue to have the threat of being even more funds taken away from the programs. Um, so often our voices are also lent to um, making sure that we don't lose the resources that we have. And we also talk about um, a temporary assistance fund, some type of um, emergency assistance that we saw really um, be highlighted through the pandemic. But even before then, we had the Eviction Crisis Act be introduced where we were asking for an emergency assistance fund that would really help families that were experiencing some type of unexpected shock. Think about a broken down car, think about losing hours at work, Anything that would make a family spiral or individual spiral um, and need prolonged assistance. And we know that so many people, as we even heard with the eviction um, that we see happening across the nation, people are being evicted for literally hundreds of dollars, very small amounts of money that if we were able to help somebody in these situations that we can really help them to create stability. If we can go to the next slide. That I'll touch on briefly because I know time is running out. Um, but racial equity is so big. Um, we we know it. Uh, we know how much it shows up in the work that we do. And I just thank Carl for so much of the breaking down of how we see that in evictions and even in um, when we talk about extremely low income renter households. You know, disproportionately it affects Black and Brown people. So when we're talking about affordability, segregation, quality, homelessness, wealth building, all of that. Uh, we know that racial inequities really manifest in housing in all of those ways. We know that we're combating the past as well as present policy um, that really needs to be addressed in order to ensure that people can be housed, um, all people can be housed um, in equitable housing as well, which is a pillar of the, the work that we do. Um, and really making sure that uh, when we talk about the multi-sector impacts of housing, if we talk about how housing has racial inequities, we can see how that just affects all these other sectors that we talk about as well. Um, so often we see that housing really is at the core and the center of so much that we see when it comes to inequities. Um, and so if we really address the housing issue, we really would make great strides in racial um, equity. If we can go to the next slide. Housing impacts everything. <laughs> if, if you can take anything from the presentation today, it's just really that the reason why we've partnered with FRAC for such a long time now, nearly six years, is this understanding that there really is a really direct link between housing and food security, and that advocates that are food security advocates, um, hunger advocates, really are housing advocates, um, really wanting to ensure that people are keeping a roof over their heads. And when they're able to keep a roof over their heads, they're able to think about the nutritious foods that they can provide to their families, to themselves for nourishment, for health. We know that's directly connected. Um, in the healthcare space, they talk often about so social determinants of health. And so really trying to find ways that we connect all of our sectors together. And then the last slide, really quickly, just to where we can take action. If you wanna take action on that particular bill, the Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act, you can go to our website, there's a take action tab, and you can send a letter directly to your um, policymaker that really makes the case for that bill. Um, again, it was reintroduced this year in the Senate, it was introduced for the first time in the house. And so we've really been working hard to really push that bill forward. So that's one thing that you can do today, immediately on our website. And you can share our housing solutions, whether online, whether in your organizations and as well. You can meet in diverse ways as we're trying to shift the narrative around housing and, and really all of our sectors as well. You can feature us if you if you have the opportunity to in meetings and publications and webinars, going back to having those diverse conversations and even using our materials. We have a podcast. So if you can share our podcast podcast episodes. Um, if you find ways that you can strengthen our state work, if you're interested in our state work, please reach out. We have sector-specific fact sheets. You can also see that on our website and share them in your meetings as well. And at the very least, you can join our listserv. And monthly, we just share everything that's happening with the campaign, ways that you can take action and the new research that's out there. So I just want to thank you so much um, for the time. And I will give it back to Alex. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Chantel. And you can totally see why FRAC is on the steering committee of this fabulous campaign, Opportunity Starts at Home. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A uh, tab. Let's see. Um, I do not know the answer to either of those, but maybe Chantel or um, Carl, you, you can answer those. If, if not, we can take those back um, to um, National Low Income Housing Coalition and get you the answers. Um, I don't know, right. Chantel, your thoughts. I, I'm, I'm most familiar with exactly how different landlords are able to access um, funding streams. Although I my impression is that most funding streams are formally open to all kinds of landlords, but it's the same sort of administrative burdens concern that you see with social safety nets. Um, do you have the sophistication and know-how to access those streams? I can get a I can get the answers back to you. We focus a lot on the renter side of the the the, the crisis, so. A lot of things that we advocate for go into line of again, how do we give somebody a voucher so that they can afford the housing and the space that they that they would like to? How can we build more housing for those um, those at the lowest end of the income stream? Uh, we don't focus too much on the, I, I guess, the provider in a way that like we actually think about policy in the way we really think about it renter focus first. Um, but I can come back with with answers to that, and then uh, also to. At NLIC, we do work specifically on like tenant protections, and we have state partners um, that work just in the variety of different policies. Since OSA is really a high level campaign, we only really talk about the ambitious funding solutions. So, the big ambitious funding things that we need in order to help our states out. Um, but we do have uh, a very robust field team that works in every single state and can give you that information. So I can I can take that back to the team. Thank you so much. Before I turn it over to Luis, who was able to, to get on to close this out, just wanted to highlight two resources. One I just put in the chat, um, which Chantel referenced, it's how much do you need to earn to afford a modest apartment in your state, which is really helpful, state-specific information. Steve, if you can go one slide back. Uh, Carl talked about how people lose access to SNAP um, often when they're evicted and the need to fix that policy. Another housing policy that intersects with SNAP is the housing uh, deduction that people who have housing can take. But since so many households are um, cost burdened with housing, spending you know more than 50% of their income on housing expenses, rent, um, there's that that amount is not represented in the in the SNAP benefit calculation. So there's a push in the closing the meal gap act uh, to remove the cap on shelter expenses. There's a SNAP, uh, there's a FRAC piece that goes into that and why it's an important policy and how it currently disproportionately harms black and uh, Latinx families. So take a look at that. And as you all know, who are um, anti-hunger champions, closing the Meal Gap Act has a lot of other provisions that would address some of the um, SNAP related concerns, i.e. Um, administrative barriers that would make it more um, readily, it would make it easier for households to access step, uh, SNAP without jumping through so many hoops. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Luis to close this out. Thanks so much. And we will be sending out a recording of this webinar along with the slide deck. Thanks so much, Alex. And again, apologies for missing the start. I had a, a funder meeting uh, that went over uh, over time, but I just wanted to uh, say thanks to Chantel and to Carl uh, for their partnerships, uh, and uh, and thanks for everybody for for making the time for this. Uh, it's so important that we all understand the intersections of, of our various streams of work, whether it's housing or or health or anti hunger work. And I encourage everybody uh, who is not a member of the Opportunity Starts at Home join it. Join it. It is so important uh, that uh, that we join these coalitions and we show and we show solidarity. Um, 
not just from an outward uh, facing standpoint, but also it just reinforces the work and it reinforces better outcomes for the people we serve. So uh, apologies again uh, for everybody and, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, Thank you so much.